So I think we will um, we will get started. So I want to welcome everyone to this evening's webinar with Bill Bakaitis. Um, it is this evening's topic is after the frost. So it's all about the late fall fungi, though we were just discussing how warm it is. Um, we have had a frost already, <laughs> a little frost and freeze warnings that we had, but today certainly did not feel like uh, any frostiness happening outside. But but um, we will still talk about what we will be seeing in the coming weeks. Um, my name is Lauren Bohr, and I am the Education Coordinator for Public and Youth Programs at Mohonk Preserve. And I will be facilitating this evening's webinar. Um, as I mentioned, um, you can use the chat to ask any questions. Um, I'll be monitoring that throughout the program. Um, and I might interrupt Bill just to uh, say, hey, this is a, a question that kind of pertains to what you're just talking about. We'll also have a chance to ask some questions at the end. So if um, if there is anything that's a little more of a broad question, we maybe I'll save that to the end um, to uh, ask Bill at the very end. So this is going to be recorded um, and it will be posted on our webpage and our YouTube channel. So um, you're always welcome to share that once it is out there with any friends that you might think, friends and family that you might think are interested in this. Um, and otherwise, we will um, just kind of use our chat function. We'll, we have a couple files that I have shared as well. So you probably see a little paper clip that's there. So um, I have a little bit on polypores, um, which uh, Bill provided for us. So that's uh, the most common kind of fall, late fall fungi that is out there that we'll be noticing on trees. And also um, a little rules of uh, macrophagy. Mike? Yeah, I didn't say that right, but it's out there. Uh, so I have those two handouts that you're welcome to um, view and download for yourself. So I'd like to introduce our presenter. It's Bill Bakaitis. Um, Bill has done several of these presentations for us, and they are all archived. So you are welcome to reference those um, on our web page. There's links to all of that in our YouTube channel. So Bill taught at Dutchess Community College for almost 40 years before retiring um, in 2006. And during his teaching career, he was granted sabbatic sabbaticals to uh, study uh, graduate level mycology at SUNY New Paltz and at the New York State Museum in Albany, um, where he worked with John Haynes, so the New York State mycologist. He's a very popular speaker, not just here, but other places, um, such as the Institute of Ecosystem Study, uh, study over in Millbrook, the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, which makes a lot of sense for the chefs, um, and Hudsonia at Bard College, as well as many other institutions throughout the Northeast. Um, in 1983, he founded the Mid-Hudson Mycological Association, and since 1984 has worked with poison control networks throughout the Northeast, and I'm sure Bill will be touching on some of the um, toxic uh, toxic ones, they're lookalikes. Mm -hmm. So you'll be touching a little bit on that today. Um, his articles have been published in New York State Conservationist, Adirondack Life, the Mid Hudson Magazine, the Poughkeepsie Journal, um, and Mushroom, the Journal of Wild Mushrooming, as well as other places. So mm -hmm. I'm very happy to have Bill presenting once again for us. Um, and this time we're going to be talking about the fungus of the late fall. So what happens after the frost? Um, I'm going to start sharing the screen here. I'll start this presentation so we can all see that. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'll be monitoring the chat. If you have any questions, pop it on in there. Um, I'm going to turn off my camera and turn off my mic and turn it over to Bill. So without further ado, here we go. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> it is a glorious, this is a glorious time of year. My gosh. Uh, I, I, I just what a gift, what a gift to be out of doors. Uh, we have had frost here. I, I'm in Dutchess County. We had several frosts uh, and I've dug most of all the tender stuff that need, not all, but almost all the tender stuff that needs to come indoors. Uh, the tubers and whatnot are dug up. Things have moved into my greenhouse and now it's warm again. <laughs> One of the reasons you dug, you dig up things like uh, um, some some tubers is that you don't want them to sprout after they've been cut down by the frost. So they're they're in the basement even though it's not that cold. But here we go. <clears throat> so uh, this is pretty obvious, isn't it? You, you walking through the woods now, you see uh, you see scenes like this on trails you used to used to used to go on. Uh, 
it's very difficult now to see some of the fungi that come come up uh, the terrestrial we call them that comes come up from the ground. Uh, here's one which uh, <laughs> only you would only see it because I pointed it out to you, right? Or because we know we're looking for that. So often when when these leaves are on the ground, what we tend to see are are fungi that are on wood on trees, uh, and those are called lignicolous fungi, wood loving mushrooms. So that, that's what we'll be looking at here today. Uh, I, I will mention uh, the Audubon Guide. If you don't have that guide, it's probably the first one you should get. It's often called the Bible of the Northeast, and it really is a true field guide. You can put it in your pocket. It has more species in there than you'll ever than you're going to see in any other book of its size, or even even the three times bigger. And they're 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 on color corrected uh, 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 sections of the book, so 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 that that helps a lot. It's very easy to use. You just look at the shape of it. If uh, this this had been uh, difficult to get during the last year because it was being printed in Japan and well, they have uh, uh, good color separation over there, but um, because of uh, those those problems of getting things to and from uh, where they belong, uh, it 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 was tied up. But now it's freely available. I think another book that you might want to get it's it's cheaper, it's smaller, it's it's much briefer, it's just the. A simple guide to mushrooms of the Northeast. This is my pen knife. You'll see that from time to time in the slides. It's three inches long closed, six inches long open. All right. <clears throat> a couple of things. Oh, maybe two other things I'll say. Uh, two very good sites to look at. Uh, Michael Quo's mushroomexpert.com. Um, if you've been into mushrooms at any length of time, you know this site. That's, that's really the go-to site. Uh, on, on the internet now. And the other four, Lignica's fungi, I would say Gary Emberger's Wood Decay Fungi. He's at, he's at Messiah University in, in Pennsylvania. And uh, it's a really wonderful uh, uh, a site for, for mushrooms growing wood. So <clears throat> uh, Lauren has mentioned the handout. I, you'll, you'll have a, be able to look at that. <clears throat> Before we go too much further, I'll just talk about something about mushroom names. There, there are three gen, large, breaking them into, into large groups, there are three major systems, uh, and names change quite a bit. Uh, the, the, first, the, the system that most of us use, the, the, the traditional system, is based on morphology, what, what fungi look like, you know, what the leaves of a tree look like, what the bark looks like. That's, 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 uh, those are field guide uh, descriptions. Uh, with mushrooms, uh, you tend to use other things along with that. You tend to use microscopes to look at things up close, and you tend to use chemicals to see how they stain. But, but essentially, those are all sort of macroscopic uh, morphological uh, uh, names. Uh, there are two other uh, systems that are widely used. One is a mating system to see how which mushrooms will mate with other mushrooms. In that case, uh, they know who they who they are, and they mate together. And and generally, in in biology, if two things mate, we consider them the same species. So that's that's something uh, another another way that that fungi are named. And the third one now is the one that's this has so many more name change is by looking at the DNA and looking at, at barcodes that that are that are derived from that. And these uh, really throw everything else into a cocked hat. And there's uh, there, the names come and go very, very frequently, and often familiar genera get broken down into into tongue twisting names uh, that are very obscure and hard to follow. So for that reason, um, I'm going to use here the the field guide approach. Uh, and in this book, you just look at the picture, you look at the mushroom, see what they look like, and then you read the descriptions. And there we go. Those of you who are will be interested in further studies on lignicolous fungi, uh, I would recommend this book by uh, Alan and Arlene Bissett and Diane Smith, Polypores and Similar Fungi of Eastern Central North America. It's it's a it's a wonderful book and up to date as as to 2021. There have been name changes since that, but it's up to date at that point. Um, and, and you, pr you probably know the Bissettes. They have a number of books based on that system. Uh, also, at the Smiley Research Center, uh, there are there's now one of the best uh, mycological uh, libraries in in our area. Uh, 
Um, and of those, I uh, just point to these. Uh, Fergus 1960 uh, monograph, Genera of Wood Decay Fungi. Uh, that's the one that Gary Emberger built his website on. Then Helwig's Polyparaceae of New England, a smaller um, uh, monograph of sort. Overholt's classic monograph and the definitive, the authoritative uh, Gilbertson and Rivard. It's a two volume series. And those are all over at the, uh, the, the research center. So they're there for you uh, if you uh, are interested. Now, <clears throat> We're, we're going to look at, uh, at both f some fleshy fungi that come up and some, some ones that are harder. Uh, in general, the, the fleshy fungi, the ones that we generally call mushrooms, uh, have what we call a monomitic cell structure. That is, of the cell types they have, there's just one, which is, is called the, the, the generative stru uh, structure there. And that one is the one that just balloons up very quickly. Uh, those of you who have been around in this sequence long enough will, will, may have looked at or have seen or may have, may, may go and, and, and see the first of the series uh, in which I, I discuss the typical uh, Basidia mycete life cycle. And, and what we're talking about in that is all of this generative uh, hyphae. It just, and when the conditions are right, it just balloons up like a balloon. It fills up with water. Okay, so... Of those, uh, there are some which are edible and some which are toxic, uh, uh, deadly, or other. And we'll talk about these uh, before we get into the harder ones. Uh, I, I printed this this uh, chart out as of uh, maybe a month or so ago, and I just saw today on my uh, my news feed there was a, a, a look at the, the the weather forecast for for the next maybe month, showing the Northeast being maybe up to 15 degrees warmer than normal and a, and a jet stream coming down and making the West very cold. Certainly is, is happening right now and it'll be going for a while. But so we, I think we can look for warm warm days out. Certainly it's gonna be warm on, on the weekend. Okay, let's then look at some of these mushrooms and see what they're like. This is one of the most common. Uh, it's Flamulina volutipes. It used to be called the velvet-footed Calibia or velvet foot. It's sometimes called the winter mushroom, uh, and it grows on sound wood. It's a dead wood, but the wood is sound. If you 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 took your knuckles and wrapped it, or you took a hammer and wrapped it, it would be hard, and and maybe even give a ringing sound. So this is uh, uh, I've discussed this mushroom before. It it it's it's facilitated by beetles, which carry the spores into the bark, and then as the larva of the beetles eat the bark and digest things, this mushroom comes up. So this is edible. It's a good edible mushroom. Uh, no problem eating that. Uh, uh, and so we may, we may find that. I found it in every month of the season around here. Here it is growing in clusters under an elm tree. And you can see uh, the, the beetle galleries right here. Uh, here it is on the surface of the, the elm tree, uh, what it looks like. It tends to be a little pinker than they normally are. They're more butterscotch. And this is what it looks like when you buy it in the store, enoki. This, these, the white ones, are grown on straw. But it's the same genetic species, even though they look different. The different substrate will, will, in growing conditions will make even the same genetics look very different. There is the most deadly uh, look-alike to that, and that's Gallerina autumnalis. Uh, the deadly Gallerina, it's often called. Uh, it grows on punky wood. That means wood that's been lying around rotting for a while, generally horizontal. Generally, the winter mushroom, Flemulina, is on vertical wood. This is on horizontal wood. So this little mushroom contains amatoxins, and it's present every month of the year, even though it's called autumnalis. It also has a number of different names. Uh, this mushroom will have a dark spore print, and you can see here where it has a ring around the stalk, which is now just the, this, the spores that are collected on that. And the spores have a very characteristic uh, a blank spot on it called a plage, um, and um, you need a microscope to see those, of course. Uh, did I mention this one? This mushroom has the same uh, toxins as amanita. So, um, it's, it's a delayed uh, death syndrome. You eat it and you die a week later. So not to be toyed with. Um, oyster mushrooms are common every month of the year around here. 
Uh, this is a typical presentation of spring, summer, and fall. Uh, and this is one which is it shows you that it can be found even with snow growing. And uh, and there it is. Uh, they, they taste, they're called oyster mushrooms, Plur Plurotus austriatus, because they have a fishy smell and taste to them. And that's because they put their little tentacles into the wood and they gather, they capture nematodes that crawl around in the, the, the wood and they, they strangle them and then digest them. And so they have extra protein in them, in them which gives them that kind of uh, um, uh, oystery smell. Here is a deadly mushroom, which uh, looks like the oyster mushroom. As a matter of fact, it's often called a small oyster. Uh, this is Plurocybella porogens. Uh, angel wings is what Gary calls it. In his book, he lists this as edible. And we did think it was edible until uh, 2004 when there were, I think, maybe 20 or so people in Japan suffered brain deterioration and died after eating this mushroom. Now, all of them had pre-existing kidney conditions, so that's probably some event there. But it tells us there's something in this mushroom which the kidneys generally clean up, uh, but which if the kidneys don't clean it up, it can uh, it can kill you. So they brought your brain, kill you. So beware of that. Here is a very uh, edible mushroom. It's a, it's called the green winter oyster, the green uh, uh, oyster mushroom, and only this only fruits after frost, and often it's in large clusters. Again, it can be on on punky wood or it can be on sound wood. I found some last week growing on on oak trees that that I saw no deterioration on the oak. This is edible. It's a little tough, a little chewy, but uh, if you have a culinary treatment for that, it's it's a perfectly fine mushroom. We may still find some of these around. This is the honey mushroom, Armillaria or Armillaria lamellia, and uh, sometimes it's called Atricopilus. It has these little hairs on the cap there. Uh, it grows up from wood, uh, uh, or near wood has rhizomes which connect it. We'll show pictures of that a little later. Uh, there are a number of species to this, but uh, th this is a, this is a very common presentation around here. You have a, a, you have gills here. It's kind of cottony below the gills and uh, pretty firm above the gills, and uh, white 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 gills and white spores, and they grow in what we call cespitose clusters. Little clusters there like this cluster right here. So you wouldn't want to eat any of these after frost. And I think the reason for that is that they're, they're pretty tough. They don't, they don't break down easily, but you can have decay going on inside of them. So after frost, when, they're, when the vitality is gone, they can be infected with bacteria and make you sick. So this, these are different species of uh, uh, honey mushrooms. You want, one might call them cultivar in a sense, but they are, they are different species. We, we, we think they're 19 or so different species of honey mushrooms in North America. This mushroom must be cooked uh, for it to be edible. Otherwise, it makes you sick. And these are the rhizomes. The rhizomorphs that often you see pasted onto a tree, and we'll we'll, see, we'll undoubtedly see some of this on the walk on Saturday, uh, and and that's attached to these mushrooms here. But they can go on one tree, work as a parasite, saprophyte, and then bring that that uh, those, those rhizomes a hundred yards or so in search of another tree, which they'll infect. Uh, these are brick caps, uh, Nematoloma sublatericeum or Hyphaloma sublatericeum. Uh, here again, you have this uh, this pinkish uh, butterscotch cap to the top of them. They're going to have a, a, a sort of purple uh, a spore print, and sometimes it, it almost looks a little green, but it's a little it's purple, and you can collect it on paper as purple. And these will grow on wood, and uh, they're often the, the the last fruiting mushroom you can find. They are edible, uh, particularly when they're young. When they get old, they get a little bitter. Uh, don't confuse them. So these are brick caps of the color of a of a saran, of a baked brick, uh, construction brick. The ones that are yellow uh, are nematoloma or hyphaloma fasciculari, and those are toxic. They they're more yellow. So you you want to be. But they also have a purplish print, So you want to be careful of that one. 
Uh, there are lots of jelly fungi which will fruit uh, no matter what the conditions are moist and it's above 40 degrees or so. Uh, uh, three of them, um, two or three of them are very common in the area. This, uh, this is a, a witch's butter, sometimes it's called. Uh, this is called, often called a jelly roll. The exidia uh, glandulosa here, and this is Tremella mesenterica, like the, the, the tripe, the mesentery of stomach. And they will disappear uh, when it gets dry, they'll dry up. And when they dry up, they look like this. And then when the rain comes, they, they just reappear like this. There is one in the area which looks more like this, but it's an ascomycete rather than basidiomycete. And that's the auricularia auricula. Uh, and that's the one that's often put into Chinese food. It has a, it's a blood thinner. And so, but uh, these will, these will, it's amazing when you look at them under a microscope, there are very few hypha there, but they just, they gather so, so much uh, material around them. The way you tell for the identify these, you really have to look at them uh, through a microscope and you want to see if the basidia is, the basidia are all divided. Is it divided vertically or horizontally? And then what do the spores look like? What's the color? So you can tell spore color uh, by the naked eye, but, but the rest of that, you'll for good de uh, identification, need a microscope. Uh, this is a very beautiful mushroom. Uh, it's called the mock orange oyster mushroom, Phyllotopsis nigilans. Uh, it's not edible. It's rather bitter. as a almost a foul smelling to it too. But I just love that, particularly when you see it, you know, it gets a little colder and there's a little snow on the ground. It's just, it is just glorious. It's just like, like a sunbeam just comes out of the wood. Um, it's, it's around for a long time. And here's a log full of them that's been around for a long time. And they get bleached. So you'd never know by looking at the top of this that when you look at the bottom of them, you have this orange color. They just get uh, they bleached out by the rain and the sun. So here is Tyromyces chianoseus, a cheese mushroom. Uh, it used to be called pol polyporous albellus. Polyporous albellus, I think. Yeah, there it is right there, albellus, yeah. Uh, it's not edible, edible, even though it has a very fragrant odor. It just smells very sweet and very nice, but it's not edible. Uh, this one here is, has a yellow mold growing on it. It's a Cepidonia stage of, uh, of um, Hypomyces. Um, Cepidonia, the Hypomyces will have a white, yellow, and a red stage often. And this is the intermediate yellow stage, I think. I didn't look at it microscopically, but that's what it looks like. So smells good. You, know, you can squeeze a lot of water out of it. Sometimes people on a lark will take these and squeeze the water out and wash their hands with them. <laughs> it smells, but they smell good. Uh, here's one uh, which looks a little bit like it. It's Hapalopolis nigilans or Hapalopolis rutilans. Uh, and this one grows uh, up into, up in, well, here's, this one has ice on it, so you can see that. You can see it's about three inches or so in diameter. The, uh, the pores are angular in this. And it's, it's one worth taking a, a moment to know because uh, a lot of people now are into collecting mushrooms for medicinal properties and they'll take mushrooms and make tea out of them. You wouldn't want to do that with this. This here has, is one of the most uh, deadly mushrooms you could, you could find. It has a neurotoxin, polyporic acid, uh, 20 to 40% dry weight there. So uh, nausea, impaired movement, liver, kidney damage, uh, and, uh, and destroys other parts of the nervous system. So it's potentially deadly and you don't know it right away. It takes about 12 hours or so to develop the symptoms. Uh, there's also a dye mushroom, a little um, KOH, uh, sodium uh, hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, uh, will make a violet reaction there. So it's often collected as, a, as the other dye, <clears throat> as a dye plant or to dry, dye wool with. And as all, most of these dye plants, they'll react with different mordants to give you different colors. So that's, that's the, some of the edible and the, the toxic lookalikes. Uh, maybe I'll just stop here and see if anyone has any questions about any of that. 
Yeah, I've been looking at our chat and so far it's pretty quiet um, as far as any questions or anything goes. So um, okay. I think you're doing just great. Okie doke. Off we go. So uh, we just looked at the fleshy fungi, which are just comprised of this generative uh, uh, hyphae. Uh, there are two other kinds. There's a skeletal hyphae and a binding hyphae. And if you have the generative plus one or the other, then it's called dimetic. And if you have all three, it's called trimetic. And most of the, the persistent fungi are going to be dimetic or trimetic. And these are often the woody conks and shelves that we find out there. Uh, as a group, they are lignicolous, they grow on wood. They are saprophytic, not mycorrhizal, they're saprophytic, they're breaking down the, the carbon material in the wood, uh, and, uh, and they can do that either through brown rot or white rot. Um, we'll look at those in a bit. Uh, they can be annual or perennial. Annual, they can put on growth rings every year, or they can they can be perennial and put on growth rings, but they, they, they retain, they don't die. And they, they infect both hardwoods and softwoods uh, in heart rot and sapwood. So we'll look at all of those things coming up. Uh, I will just point out that another, the second program of the series dealt with ecological importance of fungi. And this was covered in, in a great deal of depth at that point. So should any of this interest you, you might want to go and look at that recorded second um, program we had. So <clears throat> this is a, a pine log here, both in this is a pine too. You can see here, I, I picked this, the, this is the, the butt end because you can see the white sap coming from, from this pine. That's the sap wood. You can see that's the living part of the tree. It's just this narrow band right on the outside. The inside, all of this heartwood is dead. You know, it's just dead. And if a fungus gets in there, it can rot all of that. Uh, and the, the living sapwood will fight off a fungus, will kill it as its own uh, uh, immune system and it, it destroys any fungi that comes in, or maybe not any of them, but it, it, it tends to preserve the health of the, the log. These were where branches were coming in from the original sapling, kind of neat. Uh, and then this is a hardwood. It looks like it's an oak to me, but this is clearly heart rot here. And here you see some fungi on the outside uh, invading the, the sapwood. So these lignicolous fungi can, can invade both heartwood and sapwood. Two kinds of rot, one is called white rot and it degrades cellulose and lignin. Okay, and that's what white rot looks like. It produces a stringy sort of rot and uh, uh, because it destroys the lignin as well as the, the cellulose, it, the tree often will break and fall to the ground. Uh, and then uh, woodpeckers and other things love to get into this because as it's getting soft, a lot of insects are in there. And you see, it's very easy for a woodpecker to just go to lunch on that. Brown rot will degrade only the cellulose. And so what happens there is the lignin stays and that's what gives this, this the brown color here. So this it's often called cube rot because of the, the way, uh, particularly say something like an oak tree, you've got the, the, the annual rings and the rays. And you can see it just breaks down in these, in these cubes here. And the way it does these, the way it does this kind of rot is they release enzymes. Um, uh, let's see, uh, the one that you use to put on your cut, hydrox, sodium, uh, not sodium hydroxide. Yeah. Comes in a brown bottle and you rub it on magnesium peroxide, sodium and magnesium peroxide. So that's the magnesium peroxide is what is, is the, the, the enzyme that some of these fungi often use. So conks and brackets, this is one of the most common we see. Uh, and these are really hard. Uh, uh, there's a picture, I think Gary Emberg has a picture of some of these where, where people are standing on them. They're very hard. This is this commonly called a Fomius fomentarius. It looked like a horse horseshoe, uh, the, 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 not the iron shoe, but the hoof of a horse. Uh, these are persistent uh, woody fungi. Uh, um, as, a, as a whole, they are they're annual or perennial, dire, trimetic, white, brown rot. This is Fomius fomentarius. Uh, it looks like it's growing on birch there. 
So here is the same, maybe the same one. And here you get to see these would, would be the sort of annual growth rings here. And you see the growth rings right here. There's one, here's another, there's another up here. So every year, this mushroom will add another layer on the bottom. And the old one stays behind there. So that's a perennial one. Uh, a common name for this is amadou. Uh, and it's often called the tinder fungus. Uh, I believe Utsi, the, uh, the, the ice man, uh, Utsi they found uh, in the ice in, in the Tyrolean Alps. I believe he had this in his medicine chest. Uh, it was in the speculations was he either carried it as a tinder to, to generate fire with, or else he had parasites and he had this as to cure his parasites. But it has been you know, used as a medicinal. It's been used to dry flies in angling, to make felt like hats, and to make vegan leather. Well, <laughs> you might say, how does it do that? Well, here, here's the, uh, the, the, the fungus itself again. And there are these different annual layers there. And here's the, the substance called amadou, the skin up here. Uh, you put this entire inner structure in a heavy lye a concoction. You could use wood ashes if you want, just very strong wood ashes or, or lye. And it breaks it down and then you press it together and you can make these sheets. You can make a sheet here to dry flies or you can make a sheet, you can mold it into the shape of a hat. Okay. This, I believe, is what you call a dude. It's a soul patch. There's a, a facial hair and these look like ear piercings and a hooding. Uh, I think I think that's called a dude there. The birch conch. This is a com very common mushroom. It grows only on birch. It's called Piptoporus betulinus. Uh, betulinus, of course, means birch, or it's, it's go it goes in and out of fomatops, and sometimes it's in there, sometimes it's out. Uh, you know, this mushroom is pretty smooth on top. It's white on the bottom. It has this very characteristic rim right around the, the edge of it. Now, in the summer when these are young, uh, I have seen recipes where these are sliced very thin and they are fried in oil like potato chips, and they're called Saratoga chips. No, I have never tried them. <laughs> I value my teeth <laughs> too much for that. But uh, but they're, they're just goes to show you that if it's a mushroom, people want to eat it, you know, there you go. This, uh, many of you know this mushroom, uh, the artist conch, Organoderma aplanatum. aplanatum. Uh, it, it grows on wood and it has a, it, it, it has a very thin rim around it. Often these of it's very thin, almost knife edge thin. This will release in the summertime loads and loads, billions of spores a day, brown spores, and they cover the entire area around it, maybe two or three feet around the tree, five feet around if no wind is blowing, it's just brown. And so it's a very prolific mushroom. It, it causes white rot. So it, it, uh, it, it destroys the tree by, by uh, rotting the heartwood and the, the tree falls over. Uh, here you see the annual layers here. Uh, and the thing about this, the new, new layer when it comes down is white. And if you scratch it, it goes through to the layers underneath. This, these are the, the latest tube layer here with a white layer right here. So if you scratch that, it makes uh, uh, a white layer underneath it. Now, if you scratch up, it's on a tree, the white layer grows over the art and you don't see it. But if you knock the, the, the fungus off the tree and be very careful, you don't damage it by your thumbprint or having a fall on something. These are often brought home and they are, they are etched uh, with a needle. Uh, sometimes people you will use a wood burning thing. You don't need to though. And uh, I guess the wood burning is a greater texture. And then often they're sprayed with uh, with fixative to, to preserve that. You see them in craft stores and whatnot. That's the artist conch, Ganoderma aplanatum. Ganoderma means sort of bald head, uh, smooth on top. Flat, it's a flat-headed bald head. Yeah. Now the varnish conchs, there are a number of these. Uh, so there's Ling Chi is one name, Rishi is a name, uh, probably a lot of other names that, are, that have come from the East. Uh, the one that grows on hemlock 
is called Ganoderma suge, suge for hemlock, and there's one growing on hemlock. Ones that grow on uh, hardwood, the one around here is lucidum, lucidum, uh, or it's curtsii down south, and they are they tend to be a little lighter in color and they grow on hardwood. Um, and there are a number of these different species, but those are those, those are three of the more common ones here. Um, you uh, sometimes they'll grow in this what's called a stipitate form. They'll grow from the ground up like that. But that varnish color on top is uh, is Ganoderma again, smooth bald head there. Uh, they're widely cited as as medicinal and also traditional. Uh, you can see here, here, I don't know where this was, it might have been in Woodstock, in a health food store someplace. Rishi's best made into tea, not eaten, should be chopped and simmered in 20 minutes to extract its constituents. And I know you can buy it around. Uh, some people will, 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 will make a concoction for you, a tincture or a concoction, and uh, you can buy those. Uh, or you can buy the mushrooms, $40 a pound. Or you can walk out into your local hemlock forest and pick them yourself for nothing. So there you go. Uh, if you are interested in this, in the traditional aspect and the medicinal aspect, Diana Smith and Michaelvania, Volume 25, if you go to NAMA, N-A-M-A -A website, and, and click on Michaelvania, Volume 25, you can find this uh, article by, by uh, Diana. Diana uh, studied uh, Chinese culture and, uh, medicine, and, and, and medicines, uh, and uh, as, as uh, I think it was... Uh, I think she studied at Tufts and probably uh, um, uh, I, I offhand I don't remember. She, but she she's very very authoritative, and uh, you can have, have a look at, at this. She 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 takes issue with with the, the the issue that this is traditional. She says it's not traditional in China uh, that they only started using this when Western medicines came around. This is, uh, some of you know this, it grows on birch. It's chaga, chaga canker. And this is Inonotus obliquus. And there it is on, on birch tree. And this is what happens when it's cut off. And this is what happens when it tends to grow back. <laughs> uh, so this is only uh, uh, the sclerotia, the the, the actual hymenium of this mushroom is inside the tree. You never see it unless the tree's dead. And then you break the tree open and you find it inside that. But this will, uh, this, this, uh, a lot of people are cutting these down for medicinal purposes. Um, so it's a parasite and a sap probe. Uh, and it uh, has a lot of medicinal uh, purported uses. It's widely harvested and it causes a white heart rot there. Here you can see you can get you can buy it wild chugga chunks. It has a nice pleasing taste because mostly what you got in here is you have the birch, so it doesn't taste un, un, it tastes very similar to if you gather the birch twigs and make a tea out of that. It tastes somewhat similar to that. That's what it tastes like. This is what Michael Quo uh, and his mushroom expert says of this, and if you have trouble reading this, why don't I read it for you? <clears throat> Regarding the putative medicinal properties of this mushroom, I am sorry to put it this bluntly, but this mushroom is not going to cure your cancer nor any other ailment you may have. And if someone has sold you a product based on the assumption that it will, you have purchased some snake oil from a witting or unwitting charlatan. The only health benefits associated with consuming Inotus, Inotus obliquus results from the exercise involved with hunting it for it in the woods. There is no legitimate scientific support for the idea that mushrooms are medicinal in any specific, eat them to get better way, none. There is only pseudoscience, bad science reporting in the mainstream news media, and very wishful science reporting in the alternate health media. For further information, see Nicholas Money's Are Mushrooms Medicinal? 2016, and he's put that in for other medicinal mushrooms as well, such as the Ganoderma we just saw. Uh, this uh, the, the medicinal thing about mushrooms. There's a uh, folklore has has this the medicinal, but you know, and maybe before there were there were there were medicines. You know, people did take that, and maybe some of them got better, anecdotally. Uh, but uh, 
boy, if you've ever been sick and taken modern medicines, there's nothing like them. I can tell you, just, just, you could fart around with all this kind of uh, alternative stuff, you know, and, uh, but if you got, if you really got a bad infection or something, you, you take this, the, the appropriate antibiotic, bam. I mean, it's just, you know, uh, but we're all free to do what we want. Uh, sometimes this is collected as uh, chaga, and it also has a little flavor to it, a more bitter flavor. This is a, a this is actually a totally different kind of mushroom. This is a, 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 a an ascomycete, not a basidiomycete, and this is called black knotted cherry. It's a, this is on a cherry branch, and it's, uh, that's what it looks like it looks like chaga. And people collect it, and they boil it up, and they drink it, and they sell it, and they get better from it, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, so these are the little parathesia, which in, uh, in which the uh, aci are are there, and you can see it on that. Uh, this is uh, I've only found this two times in probably sixty years of collecting mushrooms. Uh, one was outside of Woodstock, uh, a small nature preserve there, and the other was uh, high in the Catskills. So it's a, it's a sweet, I've seen it in collection two other times, isn't it? it's, it, but it's, it's remarkable to see. It's called Sweet Knot, uh, Globophomies graviolens, uh, graviolens sweet. This is what it looks like in the summertime, and this is what it looks like in the winter. It would be lovely to see it and just know where, where it's around. I, I, I've around here, I, the, the, I visited the tree that it's on in Woodstock a few times, and it's, it, it tends to come back uh, season after season. But there you go. This is also a rather rare fungus. Uh, it's a beautiful fungus. Uh, there's another in a notice. This is Hispidus, a uh, little hairy top to it. But it has a beautiful, just a beautifully subtle uh, yellow and, 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 and buff color. This is the old one here. And it grows under it, doesn't grow on it, grows under it. Uh, and again, with all the, and I notice uh, 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 potassium hydroxide will, will thing these things uh, dark brown black. But again, it's causes a white rot uh, of oak and uh, makes the wood very brittle and it falls off. So it's called oak canker and uh, horticulturists and uh, loggers are, are, are wary of this mushroom. This is another in a notice, dryatus. Uh, of the polyporous dryatus, or now it's called pseudo in the notice dryatus. It's a parasite at, at the base of uh, deciduous trees, and it often can encircle the whole tree. There's this white belt on the outside, often can encircle the whole tree, uh, and, and it will stay throughout the fall and winter. Several, look, several other mushrooms look like that. Uh, this one doesn't. Uh, there's a flat conch, but this is a dye maker's mushroom. This is Phaeolus shrinitsii. Uh, we now know that this, there's a complex of five different species here, uh, but they all apparently die. And this is a, a mushroom which is dyed from yarn, the fabric of which was color dyed by this mushroom right here. And here it is in the late fall and winter, these two presentations right here tends to grow on the wood or uh, on the ground right next to the wood. And I've seen them, um, it's a place I walk in Maine and they come back there year after year. There's a place over near here where I've seen them, but only it can once and never came back again. And again, with, with dye plants and mushrooms using a different mordant, and those are usually metals like copper or iron, you'll get a different color to the, to the wool there. Uh, boy, I bet you know this one, don't you? This is the sulfur shelf mushroom, the chicken mushroom, the Latipper sulfurious or Polypper sulfurious. This is an edible mushroom. It is uh, um, more persistent than the ones that, uh, the, the earlier ones we talked about that come up and go very quickly. This one will grow on wood. Uh, and on a wide variety of, of wood species. Uh, but we used to think this was only one species of uh, sulfur shelf, Laia 
Latiparous sulfurous or polyparous sulfurous. Um, you often people hear people say laetiparous sulfurous. Uh, the people really in the mushrooms will say that. Uh, chicken mushroom is a common name for it. It has a, a, a consistency very much like chicken. Um, this is the bright summer, early fall fruiting of it. But now we may find something like that because it may fruit again. It's so warm. But it tends to get whiter as it, uh, as it ages. And so this is what it looks like. Uh, we used to think there was only one species of that, but now we know that there are at least five species, three of which grow in the Northeast, uh, one of which is very toxic. If it grows on, so if it grows on oak or cherry, then it's, then it's reliably sulfurous. If it grows on hemlock, it is reliably uh, Laetiparus huronensis, named after Huron County in Michigan. Uh, and that one will pretty reliably make you sick. But we may, I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll find some, some of here. This is, you know, they'll stay out quite a long time. And this is what it tends to look like uh, late fall, winter, at the base of an old oak tree. And there is one which grows on the ground, and that's Cincinnatus. And it's pinkish on top and white underneath. Uh, another name is semi albatus for that, I think. Uh, so the bleaching will occur as that the specimens age, and I, uh, and this causes uh, this causes extensive brown rot. As the oak trees die, they just turn into soil, and it's just you you can you can tell that uh, almost always what kind of mushroom. If, if there's an oak tree dying around, there's a lot of brown rot under it. And chances are are very good. This is what, caught, what produced that. Now, here's another big polypore. Uh, this is another, uh, um, it looks like a, it's often sometimes it's called a stump blossom. Just looks like a blossom, doesn't it? But you can see the size of my hat there. It's pretty big. Uh, when it comes up in the summer, uh, or spring or summer, it's, it's soft and it's edible and rather delicious. It actually will let a kind of sap out, just like a lactarius. As a matter of fact, genetically, it is a lactarius. And these are, it has the same warted spores, amyloid warted spores that lactaria has, has the same uh, milk that it has, and it tastes very good. So it's, it's an edible lactarius, even though it looks like a polypore. So lactarius genetically, polypore morphologically. Uh, this is what it looks like. Will look like now. Uh, I took this photo probably in late September. Yeah, late September. Right. Someone I, says it found Cincinnati growing on a willow tree. Yep. 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 Um, yeah, I have. There's another question here. Um, is the dye mushroom that was just shown is that the same as the turkey tail mushroom? No, it's not. Uh, let's see, which one did we show there, the dye mushroom we showed? Not this one. This one. No, this is quite big. This is quite, this is what you're talking about. Faolus can be a foot or uh, even larger in size. Uh, this is six inches right here. Turkey tail is generally about three inches. Uh, and we'll look at turkey tails coming up. Uh, but if they, they, they look superficially like that. You're, you're, you're right, they do, except in the size. So it's not a bad guess, uh, but it's not a turkey tail. You'll see the difference when we get to the turkey tails coming up here. Okay, here we are with this one. Um, here we are. Uh, Bondarzuia berkeleyi, named after two mycologists, Bondars and Berkeley. Oh, next, next, sorry. Previous, oh, you know what's up here? Lauren, you have to change the, the, the there we go. All right. Here's another mushroom, which uh, early in the year is edible. Uh, you wouldn't know at this time of year, but early in the year it is edible. It's a uh, ischnoderma, <laughs> ischnoderma resinosum, or polyporus resinosus. So it's uh, if it's on a conifer, it's benzoinum, ben benzoinum. Uh, it causes a white rot, very fragrant. 
very fragrant and it's edible when young and you can see here i can't enlarge this uh, for my but uh, when you you go to go to the uh, google this and you'll find some of these you can enlarge them and just see these amber drops that come out the resin that comes out of it and this is what it looks like when you slice it open in the edible stage uh, you know slice it up slice it into a uh, quarter inch uh, three eighths inch slices and and in butter uh yeah yeah that's good uh finish with a little um little wine good yeah oh and you all know this right polypus frondocious yeah or griffola frondocious this will grow at the base of oak trees i have not found any this year not found any i have in past years found them all the way up to thanksgiving but this year i have not found any of them around here i have looked at thousands of oak trees thousands uh, i just have not found any of them i look for them in maine i haven't found any of them there either but in maine uh there they are i'm sorry <laughs> no they, they come in lots of i'll just show you the one and they found in maine here here they are in Maine. this is in Jess's Fish Market in Rockland, Maine, on September 20th, and these are fresh species. They, just, they say locally foraged. I assume they were. They don't look like they're cultivated. That one might be cultivated, but this this is what you tend they tend to look like. Uh, Sixteen dollars a pound at your very friendly uh, fish store. Um, health food stores will probably double the price there. So frondocious grows at the base of oak trees, uh, occasionally ma maple, but almost always oak. Uh, it's perennial. It'll grow there year after year after year. And if you know the oak tree, it's it's uh, it's infected. You can go there and uh, reliably find it every year, except this year. And I think it's because it was so dry. Comes in a variety of colors. You know, when it's this brown color, it looks like leaves, looks like a pile of leaves. But this uh, blue black color, that's that's remarkable, isn't it? And the black, the the dusty black color, and the white color. You know. And these are uh, all these I've, I've photographed, so they're, uh, they're, there's no one's dying, and they're I mean that's what they look like. And uh, you look you want to look for oak leaves, oak leaves, you know, oak leaves. There's no oak leaves here, but this was oak. This is an oak log for sure. So um, if they're weakly parasitic. Uh, in Germany, uh, the mycologists there, some of the mycologists there, seem to think that in the early stages, it's actually beneficial to the tree, maybe mycorrhizal in some way, but then it becomes parasitic and it, uh, you know, a good parasite doesn't kill its host. So it doesn't kill the tree. It lives in a, in a friendly association with the tree for a long time. Uh, I've collected from trees for 15 or 20 years, same trees produce. And if you cut the tree down, it still produces from the roots. But it does cause a white butt rot, and after a while, the, the, the butt becomes so weakened that the tree blows over. And it does so. So it's often called Miyataki, Hen of the Woods. Most of you know that. And just again, I'll go back to that. This is what they look like. There's one tree here, and there were one, two, three, four of them here, and there must be two more in that basket. And they were all from this one tree. <laughs> so that's the kind of edible mushroom you want to find, you know, just. Uh, the only thing that, that resembles that, uh, there's one that grows in the spring, which vaguely resembles sort of more, more like cauliflower. But this is uh, Mary Pilus substinii or giganius. Uh, it looks very much like the hen of the woods when it is young, as it gets older, it turns black and it's edible. It's tough and a bit bitter and it's uh, it's tough and it blackens uh, as it ages. And you can find it on lots and lots of different trees. Now, some of the really, really hard things. This is this one grows only on locust. It's a uh, uh, Fomis rhimosus. Uh, or Philinus robiniae, robiniae from locust. Uh, uh, Fomies, it's a, the, just the old macroscopic Fomies there. You can see it's, it's, it's going to be there year round. It has a brown spore uh, surface, pore surface, uh, and a cracked cap. 
it's a perennial uh, and it has those annual layers and it causes a white rot. So if you look here in this locust tree, you can see it has a white rot there. Now there are not many fungi which will digest locust, you know, but this is one that does. You know, locust is often used as a fence post and uh, I have worked on fences that have been there 125 years and the posts were still strong. This, this really kills most fungi. But uh, and they, and they, one, of the, one of the things they say, don't ever eat any fungus growing on locust because they'll pick up those, those toxins. This is Fomi's pinicola, has a red band around it. That's Fomatopsis monsiae for, monsiae for another mycologist, often called the red belted polyper. Uh, again, this is a potent brown rot fungus. Uh, it causes heart rot of pine and the trees fall over uh, and uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of up, up north in the in, in, in woods around me in Maine the, or in the Adirondacks, just a deep, deep layer of that brown duff. Uh, this is one of the more potent fungi there. It has in the past been used for antioxidant and anti-cancer um, purposes and uh, um, don't think so anymore, but there it is. So there's one that's like that. There's a white band around it and that grows uh, on evergreens. And uh, the, the common name for that is heterobasidian anosum. But anosum is apparently a European species which doesn't grow in, in North America. There are a half dozen other ones there which uh, and they all cause white pocket rot, the same sort of pocket rot there. And uh, they, um, they but, but they often encircle the, the entire tree. And it's, and it's often called heterobasidian and there's some, then we get to tell the differences through microscopic analysis. Uh, so here's a heterobasidian species. And uh, this shows something interesting. Um, I, I, I'm listed here as a geotrophic orientation. Fungi will grow with their hymenium, that spore-bearing uh, surfaces, uh, oriented so that when the spores fall, they fall down to the earth. Okay, and that sort of way of growing. Well, this this configuration here shows that recently this tree was standing. This tree was standing, say, last year, and so the spores were falling down. The tree fell down, and when the next layer of this came out. It's oriented now with reference to gravity, and now the spores are going to fall down. So I don't know if this is a regularity or not. I just took a guess at it, um, but it's usually identified as uh, anosum. There are a lot of smaller shells. Some have gills, some pores, some is parchment. Uh, so we'll have a look at that. And this is where the turkey tails come in. We'll have a look at these. Uh, the one which is the most easy to identify probably is the one which grows on oak and only on oak, and that's Dedalia quercina. Quercina means oak. And Dedalia is from Daedalus, who had his chambers. Um, oh, I've forgotten all the myths, but he, he, he made wings to, uh, to escape it, but I think he used wax to... to glue the feathers on and you got too close to the sun and poor Daedalus. Uh, but this, this is very thick gills, uh, just a, a beautiful mushroom. I've often thought it would be neat to take this and use it to make block prints. Wouldn't that be neat to sort of make a block print on your wallpaper or on something? I just think they're just, I mean, they're just so wonderful. Only on oak. There are these that have uh, other polypores and uh, this is generally when you find them uh, you're going to be they're going to be called deadalopsis confragosa. Uh, opsis means in the face of or looks like Daedalus. So this looks like Daedalus okay as those gills but these maize is much thinner and the interesting thing here about um, confragosa is that you can get long gill like structures or you can get ones that are breaking up into make pores. And uh, 
they cause a white rot of the sapwood. Uh, and typically you find a combination of gills and pores. If you rub them, they'll turn pink, uh, sort of a pinkish brown buff uh, when they're young. How about this glorious thing? Boy, she was, I, I just can't get over how, how beautiful some of these mushrooms are. Oh my, uh, this, this, this will be found fresh. We can find this fresh this time of year. This is Lenzites sepiaria or now glowy phylum sepiarium. It's on softwood, this is on pine right here, and it causes a brown rot, but it has this really luscious, deep, deep yellow-orange color. Boy, it's just sepia, I guess that's sepia color. But it, I mean, it's just, it's just striking. This is Lentinus, Lentinellus your sinus. I, I like the older name, Lentinus your sinus. It almost sounds like a curse word. Lentine, Lentine is your science. Lentinellus, little bear. Little bear mushroom has a hairy, fuzzy cap. Let's see, a hairy, fuzzy cap here. I guess it's the bear sort of name there. And it typically has these serrated gills. If you look at the gills with a 10 power lens, they're like a sawtooth edge. They're serrated. Uh, tough, they're leathery. Late summer, fall species can be found all winter. Uh, so this is the fall presentation, the winter presentation here when it gets sort of beaten up. And here's one which, uh, which is atypical. It has pores. So here's another, I mean, it's generally these kind of gills right here, but it has these pores on it. And he has this hairy cap again, and that's uh, Gary Einberger had used this uh, in, his, in his presentation to show this atypical presentation. So I felt I have to do the same. So th these are all my photos. But, yeah. Favilus alveolaris. Uh, I think this might be called the hexagonal pore, polypore. It's on hickory and other hardwoods. Uh, hardwoods uh, causes a white rot. But you see how they're they're drawn out like this. There's a beautiful drawing of this in Gary Linkoff's uh, book. There's, a, there's a, a drawing of that too, showing the the, the the pattern of growth on that. They say when that's young, it is edible. I've never tried it, but uh, but there you go. So now the turkey tails, uh, uh, Shira. So here are the turkey tails. They're much smaller. Um, and the, the true turkey tail is called Trimedes versicolor. It's one of a half dozen names for this, this uh, uh, Trimedes Versicolor. Versicolor means many colors. And you can see in this one here, right here, you've got the blues and the tans and the oranges and the buffs. And they grow in these kind of layers coming out like that. But here's a just a brown coloration. There's this azure blue color. I've lost the blue here in, in changing from one slide to another. But Kodachrome 25 captures that deep blue so wonderful. Uh, and some of them are brown. So they're very thin. They have pores. Uh, uh, and uh, the pores come from, if you cut them across, the pores don't come from one layer, but they're staggered in depth and where they come from. Uh, it, it is not a dye mushroom. But it can make wonderful jewelry. You can um, moisten these, flatten them out, and then uh, or use them as they are, and um, and make uh, earrings. You find, put them on some findings, make earrings, or press them into uh, to uh, epoxy and make brooches and things like that. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, here's the false turkey tail, and these are called parchment fungi. This is Styrium ostrea. Okay. And you see here, it has the alternate bands of coloration here. And it grows in overlapping colors, uh, uh, fruiting bodies. But when you turn it over, there are no pores there. It's just very, it's called parchment because it's very thin. And the, the, the basidia grow right out of the underside. There are no pores or, or gills or teeth there. It just grows right there. Very thin. So this is Styrium uh, austria, false turkey tail. This is Styrium, so this might be two or three inches in diameter. Sometimes you might find one that's bigger, but 
generally this small. And this one here might be a half inch to three quarters inch in, in diameter. This is complicated and they look very complicated. This is the most common uh, mushroom I find in the winter. Uh, trichaptum or tricaptum, some people call it, biformis or biforme. Uh, biformis because it has pores that break up into teeth. Okay, and there's the pores there that break up into teeth. When you, when you look at it online, you can find some, some examples and you can enlarge them and you can see it's biformis, two forms, pores and teeth. It used to be called uh, polyporous pargaminus for the purple color there. And I didn't enhance this color. That's the way they, that's the way they look there and when they're very fresh. Uh, there's a number of different species here. There are probably six different species uh, found year round. That's the more the summer color and the fall and winter color. Uh, Trichaptum ebitinum if it's on conifers. Now, I say there are six species here, and it's the most common fungus I find. And there's a reason for that. You know, if you're gonna find a mate, you know, it's, you have to look around to find someone to mate with. This mushroom can mate with itself in 17,000 ways. In other words, this mushroom has 17,000 sexes. So when a spore falls from this mushroom and falls on a twig next to it, it is almost certain to find a mate. It is all dead certain to find a mate. Doesn't have to search far. That's why I think it's so prolific. And I and I can't really say why it is that this complex of six species, but they may favor different temperatures. Certainly they favor different uh, uh, substrates and maybe others do the same thing. One of them grows only on birch. I may have a picture of that one grows only on birch, uh, but uh, but it's a, it's a, it's it's causes white rot and it's uh, it's just present every every walk you go on you're going to find this mushroom. We'll find it. This is Lenzites betulina. It's a gilled mushroom, uh, like a turkey tail. Looks just like a turkey tail. Has gills and pretty dominant gills. You know, pretty wide gills here. Uh, and it grows on uh, birch and other hardwood, hardwoods. Uh, here, here is pretty beefy kind of mushroom, uh, three inches in diameter across there. This one is almost like a parchment fungus. Uh, this is Poronigilus conchifer, has a little nest in the cap. Typically on elm, but you but you can find you might think of these as turkey tails too. They have these alternating bands of color, and it's that's why it gives this whole group that sort of common name. There's one of these turkey tail groups that's all brown, all sort of mustard brown, mustard yellow, and that's Philinus gilvis. And Philinus is going to uh, have uh, KOH will turn black on that, and. Uh, the pores are very tiny pores, and it causes a white rot of the sapwood. Um, so the mustard, it's, 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 that's a pretty good indication of what you got. That's a mustard color. Uh, here's one that glows in the dark. Panis stypticus. This is the top. This is the underside. And this is a little stubby little uh, stem here, and then these gills. And this one... Um, uh, it's often on oaks and other trees. This one will glow in the dark. Okay, there are a group of mushrooms, a number of mushrooms grow in the dark. This is one, um, the uh, false chanterelle, uh, hmm, what is that, a jack-o'-lantern mushroom will glow in the dark. The rhizomes of honey mushroom will glow in the dark. Um, same principle, I think, as, as um, lightning bugs. It's an ADP, ATP transition, phosphorus transition. Maybe I don't have that. Um, Trimedes grows on oak, on, on birch in here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is another one that makes a wonderful uh, art object. This is Pycnopora cinnabarinus or Trimedes cinnabarinus. 
Uh, all, there's one also called Sanguinius, which is redder than this. This appears year-round on hardwoods, often on cherry. Here's a white rot. But these are um, they're, 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 they're beautiful mushrooms, and they're, the color stays. So you could, I've seen wonderful pendants and pieces of, uh, of jewelry made of, of these ornaments made of this. Um, there's a tree I know. Uh, well, I want to tell you about the tree, but there it is. Here's Schizophyllum commune, commune. And again, it has these split gills underneath. It has gills underneath. Here's the top of it. It doesn't really look like a turkey tail, but it's, you know, like feathery, turkey you know, tailish. Uh, generally, if it's all growing on the side, it has a tail. If it's growing underneath, it just, you know, has this kind of circular presentation. So these are gills that are split. And in this one here, there are, it's, it's useful for genetic studies. This one has 23,000 sexes. The way they do that, and you might have how they do that, there are two alleles here. One, and I've forgotten how, how many uh, combinations one allele has. There are two, there are two uh, genes that, that, that code for sex. One has something like, I don't know, say four, say, let's say 50 different um, alleles. The other has something like 20 different alleles. You multiply them, that's how many different sexes there are. And this one uh, has been known to infect humans and it can fruit in the mouth on the hard palate, in the lungs on nails. Um, so this one um, is pathogenic in that way. Also has a gray rot. There's an intermediate mixture of enzymes. You know, uh, if you go into a foray where there, where there are thousands of mushrooms which are collected and you sit in a microscope and a over a microscope in a room where all those mushrooms are, it doesn't take more than a half an hour before you start to wheeze and cough just from all the spores in the in the house in the house or in the, wherever it is, you know. Just every just about everyone who's who's in there was wheezing and coughing. So if you, one has an, a, a, a damaged immune system or a weak immune system, things like this can can get a hold of you. Uh, very often when you collect uh, fungi, you're going to find wood infected like this. It's called spalted wood. And Tremetes versicolor is particularly uh, effective in doing that. This is the raw spalting right here. Here's the, here's the turkey tail right here. This is where, where one, one group of turkey tails set up, sets up its hegemony and another one sets up its hegemony where they go to war between one another. And uh, the wood can be just beautiful. Turn bowls and carving with that. It's called spalted wood. Small stuff. Um, and I think we'll end up with the small stuff. There are typical stock polypores, the winter polypore, Polyporus primalis, uh, Polyporus varius or elegans, has a black stem on it. Uh, both will fruit in the fall. This is elegans as it gets bigger, maybe six inches in diameter, covering a whole log. Uh, Bird's nest fungi aren't these aren't these aren't they gorgeous? This is Cyathus striatus and this is Crisibulum levi, and you'll find these in wood chips. So if you're over at New Pulse, when I when I was going to New Pulse, boy, I I'd be late for class often because I'd go I'd go hands and knees looking at this stuff, you know. And often the ones I work with uh, with. Uh, um, some some people who do studies uh, of fungi uh, throughout the, the the growing season and whatnot, and we all these are often brought in because they they, they they persevere. They're just beautiful little eggs inside. A drop of rain will push them right out. That's a yeah. Uh, Cryptoporus vulvatus. Uh, this grows on jack pine. We might find if there's any jack pine on our walk, which is in in the preserve, we'll, we'll, we might find it here. It's a uh, um, the little pores are hidden in this, and little beetles open it up to release them on two needle pine. Lycoperdon piriformi, the pear shaped puffball. This is edible, uh, one of the better puffballs in terms of terms of taste. Uh, it's on uh, on oak and other hardwoods. We might find some of that. Uh, getting a little late, but we might find some. This is Daldinia concentrica. It's actually a European species, but uh, we, uh, we, we, we call that, uh, 
that's a name used in, in most field guides. It's actually probably childe, uh, called carbon balls. And then you see how they, they grow in these rings, inside rings. And the spores, see, they release the spores uh, in a clock-like fashion. And they've actually been sent into outer space uh, on spaceships in order to see if they, if they keep time in outer space, which they do. There's some crust fungi. There's a white crust, which is Irpex lacteus. And there's a brown tooth crust in the Cachea olivaceum. You can just look at them and tell what they are there. And then these rhizomorphs from, uh, from the honey mushroom. And, oh, then lichens, right. Well, we'll probably see lots of lichens. I'm not a lichenologist. I don't know much about them, except by morphology. This is a filamentous. These are fruticose. They make little fruiting bodies. Uh, these are folios, and these are crustose. This folios, and this is crustose. This one only grows within 100 or 200 yards of salt water. Uh, and they're named after the, um, the Ascomycete, which, which they're a partner. Well, there comes a time when uh, when everything dries up and all that's left. Uh, this is the rail trail, the Shokan rail trail before when it was still rail. And there's nothing there but poverty grass. And then, you know, freeze is coming and then uh, the ponds freeze up and the woods freeze up. And then uh, the Catterskill Falls freezes up and then uh, and it's time to go skiing. And, and there you go. So that's uh, that's that. There we go. So now we've got some 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Let's hear them. All right, yeah, we do. We have um, some time for questions, which is great. Um, so far, it's pretty quiet in our chat. Don't have any questions there. Um, I was just thinking as you showed the um, the railroad ties, um, I remember years ago I learned about a fungus that was called oh. the um, Oh gosh, like the train derail? The, tra the train goes, wrecker, yeah. The yeah, train, the train wrecker. wrecker. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. I forgot the name of the mushroom though. Let's see. Uh, I can see that mushroom. I collected it on that rail trail. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it is related to shiitake. Uh, and I can't call the name of shiitake's Latin name offhand. But it's related to it. It is edible. It's white. It's a white spore print, and it's very tough. It is edible. I've never eaten it, but it's not. But it may, I wouldn't because if it grows on rail, it's probably picked up the creosote or whatever. Well, I shouldn't say it's probably picked it up because fungi fungi digest their food outside the body, and they release enzymes to digest whatever's in the wood in this case, and then and then eat that. But I just, I doesn't feel right to eat something growing on railroad ties. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. 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 It just, it just made me think of that when you showed the, the railroad ties. And... Neolentinus lapidius. Yeah. Lentinus, uh, le, ne, Leolentinus lapidius, or Arf, Arf says. So, how does Laetiparus urinensis differ from Sulfurius? It looks uh, identical. It looks, I mean, microscopically, there are some differences. That's how Smith was able to differentiate it. Uh, and, and he did that in 2001. Uh, until that time, uh, I'm saying, going to take a guess, it's Arif. Uh, until that time, Arif, uh, we didn't know that it, it existed as a species, but we knew that some people got sick when they ate sulfur shelf. And uh, uh, it tended to be women. And it tended to be people who had alcohol, women who had alcohol with the meal. That was that was the one that was most likely to be infected. And uh, Ernst Both, who runs the herbarium of the, the in Buffalo, uh, was in the forefront of saying this was a sex-linked condition. And um, he he drew attention to that. And around that same time, that's when. Um, Alexander Smith was able to find some uh, growing on hemlock and uh, show definitively that it was a different species. Looks the same. You're not going to differentiate it macroscopically. There are some microscopic differences, and there's certainly some biochemical differences, and there are going to be some genetic differences. It has a different protein. So, um, so that's, that's, that's the case there. Um, other than that, how does it differ? Uh, 
Um, I was married to a woman who ate it. She said it was good. <laughs> she said it tasted good. She didn't know. She didn't know at the time that it was, but it made her sick, right? And uh, and there it is. I, I, I will tell you that I know of a case in Maine where a woman ate apparently that mushroom along with uh, grifola uh, in one meal, and she suffered a, a rather immediate gastrointestinal problems, and a year later was still sick. So uh, it, it caused, and it, the, 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 the supposition is that it was the urinensis which caused in her a rather prolonged um, illness. Mm. I see in the chat here, thank you, R, for those, uh, Arif, 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 for both of those questions. June says, I just want to confirm that chicken of the wood is toxic if it grows on hemlock tree, right? Uh, well, yes, if it grows on hemlock, it's not, it's not chicken of the woods. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, I suspect that it's possible, it may be possible for, for it to grow on hemlock, but we know that what typically grows on hemlock is, is Laetipris huronensis. So mm -hmm. that's right. If it's growing on hemlock, do not eat it. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Uh, chat back if it's not. <laughs> yeah. now, I know that is Lentinus lepidius, lepidius. Yeah, but uh, I have found it on the, the ties of the rail trail before it was before it's now tar, and on trees next to it, too, up near chimney hole section. I found it there. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, still pretty quiet there. And it is a kind of interesting um, this year, since we had such a dry, a dry summer that a lot of the um, fall fungi, late summer fall fungi that I've been looking for, you know, I haven't been finding. So, um, yeah. and I know you were saying earlier that um, you haven't found any hen of the woods this year. Um, so I found no one. Uh, yeah, no hen of the woods, right? I found yeah, one. No hen. No, yeah. no grifola. I found one one a sulfur shelf uh, that was old it was it was white already mm -hmm. uh, how i just want to address something howard says here he says i found cincinnatus growing on a willow tree uh i i take it you mean at the base of a willow tree cincinnatus apparently grows on the butt and where, where it's on the ground not on the tree itself uh it, it, i have photographs of ones growing uh that were pinkish and white that at the time were were, uh, were called, I think it was semi-albidus. Uh, I assumed that they were that they were Cincinnatus, but uh, at the time that, that I was doing the work on them, they, they keyed out to semi-albidus. But they were all, I think they, I think Cincinnatus, you might check on that, um, uh, Howard, check on that and see if it's a, uh, um, if it grows on the wood or just on the tree. So Eric says, I just ate some puff balls for dinner that I found this afternoon. Were they, uh, were they here for me, Eric? <laughs> small puff balls on wood? Hmm. It was at the base. Oh, it was at the base. Okay, right. Uh, Howard says, since this is the base, Eric says, mm -hmm. smaller, smaller than... Like a part on piriformi. Hmm. And wood chips. On wood chips. Well, I know there are some the size of peas. Uh, well, good for you, Arif. Uh, I, I don't I don't know which one you ate though. Okay. So uh, June says, can you give more detail about the difference between brick cap and its toxic lookalike? Yeah, I can. Brick caps will tend to grow will grow on hardwood. Uh, it can be it can be sound wood or it can be uh, uh, rotten wood. Uh, it's, it's often the last of a mushroom you find fruiting, uh, and I find it fruiting in snow even. Um, it has a brick, as a as a, a brick red cap on it, sort of a dull, you know, like a, like a like the bricks used for paving or construction, um, and the. Um, The one that grows earlier in summer, which is yellow, is, um, is, is will also have, they'll have purple spore, but it's smaller. 
Now both have a purplish spore print and it's more yellowy. And then there's one capnoides, which is kind of in the middle. And I don't even want to, I wouldn't, I, I, if it's, if it's, if it's, if it's capnoides, uh, I, I don't, don't have anything to do with that one either. So the only one I would, would eat, and I've only eaten them when they're very young is the, uh, the brick cap. Something went bing. Yeah, I got an email. Sorry, I forgot to mute my email. <laughs> <laughs> that was me. <laughs> your husband saying the baseball game's starting. Cut this stuff out. Let's That's go. right. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Great. It is World Series season, so maybe that's what uh, <laughs> that's what everyone's thinking of. Uh, okay. Well, but, I, hope to, yeah, I hope to see that some of you uh, may have, who have signed up for the walk on on uh, the weekend. We'll see what we can find and how many we can identify. Bring your field guides if you're coming. Uh, uh, and as as always on the preserve, this is an educational walk. It's not for we take photographs uh, and and occasionally if there's something that's maybe a scientific you want to look at it under the microscope or something, we can do that. But otherwise, uh, uh, we leave things in the woods there. To, to mm -hmm. Yeah, there. and it's going to be um, delightful weather. So whether or not you can join uh, Bill this weekend, um, yeah, I highly encourage you to get out and look for some mushrooms. We've, we've been fortunate this later season of the fall to have some oh. rain. So, um, yeah, it was just so dry at the end of the summer, early fall, that there weren't a whole lot of mushrooms out there. But um, there are yeah. a few who have been coming up now. Yeah, we, and we should say that we actually canceled that walk because we, we thought it was not ethical to, to lure people out in the woods. There's nothing there. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so, we, put uh, off, we put off a month and a half or so or so we can do it right now. So Yeah, we'll Exactly. And the weather, I think, is going to be quite warm, unnaturally warm for November. Yeah, so it yeah. will feel a little more like early September than yeah. um, early November. So <laughs> really fine. Yeah. I, I am tempted to say something else. I just dug up a lot of the tubers in my garden. And I, for whatever reason, I have an, an embarrassment of, uh, of two kinds of lily, the, the, the canna lily and also peacock lily. So canna lilies and acidenthera. And I'm going to bring a couple of bags of that. If anyone wants any of these tubers for for next year, uh, you can you, you can have them. I mean, I, I advertise to all the gardeners I know. I really have a, a lot more than I need. So if you <laughs> want some of those, come along and uh, bring those home. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll see you there. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you, Bill, for this wonderful presentation this evening. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Again, this has been recorded. So perhaps you are even watching this at a later time than live. Um, but I will be sending out the link to everyone who has registered. Um, and it is going to be posted on our YouTube channel and our web page. So um, tell your friends if they weren't able to make it and as you think that they'd be really interested in this topic. Um, and Bill has plenty of other topics as well on mushrooms. And so those are all archived under virtual recordings on our web page. So I will send that out to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Bill, for your time this evening. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.